Okay, folks, welcome back. Couple of reminders. One is uh, that your first quiz is a week from today, okay, next Monday. So I just wanted to remind you of that. I did send you, I think I sent you the past quizzes on the, towards the end of last week. I'll send it again with the review session. It will be the first 30 minutes of class, 10.30 to 11 o'clock, it will be in the room. So if somehow since COVID, people seem to think there's this free option to take things online. This quiz will be in person in this room. Um, it will be open book, open notes. You can have your, your iPad open. You can even use your laptop if that's where you've kept your slides. But don't use your laptop in Excel because it'll actually slow you down. You will not be able to finish the quiz if you try to use it. The numbers are numbers you should be able to, if you have a calculator, even in your head, you should be able to do it. It's really not about testing you to the fourth decimal point. It's about seeing if you can apply what we've talked about in class to a real company. Okay, so. Next Monday, first 30 minutes of class. If you have to miss the quiz, you have to let me know before 10.30 next Monday. And let me emphasize it again, not after the quiz saying, sorry, I just, because that's the only way I can enforce and make sure that the people who took the quiz are actually, you know, getting graded for the quiz. Because otherwise you can show up, take a look at the quiz, that this is too difficult. I'll act like I wasn't there. I know you're not the kind of person that would do it, but there are kinds of people who would do it. So before 10.30 next Monday, let me know. And if you're not going to make the quiz, here's what will happen. The 10% will get moved to the remaining quizzes in the final exam. The other two quizzes will now become 12% apiece and the final exam will become 36%. So, but what you will lose if you miss a quiz is that option of throwing away your worst quiz because this will then be treated as your worst quiz, a zero point, I'll throw it out. So it technically doesn't hurt you in terms of the overall score, but you lose some optionality. So with that out of the way, I don't know how many of you got a chance to get on a Bloomberg. Did any of you get a chance to get on a Bloomberg terminal? Okay, at least some honesty here, a couple of people. Okay. If you do get a chance, do it on your way today. You know? Get to the fourth floor, get on a Bloomberg terminal. It, how much time did it take you to print out the beta page for your company? Did you print out the beta page or did you just get on a Bloomberg? Okay. It should take about five minutes. We're not, we're not talking about, and you know, I'm not particularly fond of Bloomberg terminals. People are attached to them, but they're nice to have, especially for that beta page, because otherwise you have to do digging. You can do it online for free in places, but it takes a lot more digging. So see if you can print out that beta page, because today we're going to talk about the process of estimating betas, the regression we introduced at the start of the last class. As we know, we take every finance class, we're told run a regression of returns in the stock against returns in the market index. And you think, oh, that should be easy. But then you have these choices, right? How far back do you go? Do you use daily, weekly, monthly, or today? You can use intraday returns. You can actually use every five-minute returns. What index should I use? You know, we have hundreds of choices of indices. How do I compute returns? You say, what do you mean, how do you compute returns? When you buy shares of stock in a publicly traded company, what are the two components of your returns? One is, one is change in price, which happens every moment of every day. The other is dividends, which don't show up every moment of every day. They're once every three months, once every six months, once every year, but they're part of your returns. 
So returns have to be computed and then you run the regression. So I'm going to give you my choices for Disney and try to explain why I made the choices that I did, including perhaps the limits of my own choices and then show you what the regression looks like. What I'm trying to say is people ran regressions before Bloomberg came along, before we had computers. So this is not something that requires a service. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand compute the returns for Disney, computer regression using my Excel. So at least I use my computer. But then I'm going to compare it to the Bloomberg beta page for Disney so you can see where Bloomberg gets its numbers. This isn't a black box. There's not some team at Bloomberg working on estimating the beta. It's computer driven. So with Disney, here are the choices I made. I chose to go back five years and use monthly returns. Why? Because I like five-year monthly returns. I know lots of services use weekly returns and go back two years. I just think you get more time in your regression, more chances for things to even out with five years, and I'm going to use monthly returns. I also use the S&P 500 as an index. Now, remember, we're trying to estimate a beta for the CAPM. In the CAPM, we all hold the market portfolio, and the market portfolio should include every traded asset held in proportion to its market value. So you'd like an index that gets as close as possible to that, right? Now, do you see why you should never use the Dow 30 to get a beta? It's only 30 companies. And I'm not even sure how they get the 30. It's some strange mix of market cap and something else. You see, what about the NYSE composite? It has more companies than the S&P 500. You're right. But the problem with the NYSE composite is some of the biggest companies in the world are no longer on the New York Stock Exchange. All the big tech companies are on the NASDAQ. So the NYSE composite fails because it takes away almost 20% of your market value by removing those companies. So what about the NASDAQ? The NASDAQ is a tech index. It's not a market index. You take out the big tech companies, there's nothing left. You can see almost by exception, you're backing into the S&P 500. Somebody over the weekend said, why don't we use something like the Wilshire 5000? Actually, in, in, in terms of, uh, of an actual index, it's a pretty good index. It's 5,000 companies, market cap weighted. It just doesn't have enough history for people to have any sense of connection to it. Now you can see why almost every service in the US that estimates betas estimates it against the S&P 500. But there is a fatal flaw in all of these services and how they estimate betas, including my regression. When you go back to the CAPM and we said, you all hold the market portfolio, every traded asset. Did I say in what geography? There's nothing in the CAPM that says only US stocks. So in theory, if this were truly the CAPM, our market portfolio should be a market weighted index of not just US stocks, but all stocks globally. There is a global index out there that is, I mean, there are lots of global indices, but the most widely used global index is, so, is called the MSCI index. It's been around a long time. The problem with the MSCI index is it just picks the largest companies in every market. It's not a full index. So in a sense, while the MSCI is an attractive index from the perspective that it brings in global companies, it does not factor in many of the smaller companies, the riskier companies in the market. So I'm going to end up with the S&P 500. It's only 500 companies, but it's saving grace is that are the 500 largest market cap companies in the US. In terms of proportion of overall stocks, the S&P 500 is about 80% of all US stocks, even though it's only 500 companies. The remaining 7,000 publicly traded US companies account for only about 20% of the market cap. So I've chosen a time period. I've chosen monthly returns. I've chosen an index. I've got some grunt work to do. I've got to compute the returns I'd make on Disney every month for those 60 months, the returns I'd make on the S&P 500 every month for those 50 months, right? So I went into Yahoo Finance and I collected the prices for Disney every month. You can do it on, for any company. Type in Yahoo Finance, basically find your company, ask for monthly price at the end, of, end of the month prices. And I computed the returns. And I'll give you an example of what this would look like mechanically using one month. December of 2009, Disney at the, at the end of November was trading at 30.22. At the end of December was trading at 32.25. So during the course of the month, the stock went up about $2.03. That's 
there's price appreciation. It was a good month if you're a Disney stock order. That's how much you made in price change. I checked to see if during that month there was a dividend and it happened to be an ex-dividend month. You know what an ex-dividend month is? Ex-dividend day is the day by which you have to buy a stock to be able to collect the dividend. So that's the day the ownership of the dividend passes from one investor to another. November, December happened to be that month and I got a 35 cent dividend. So in total, during the month, I made $2.03 as price appreciation, 35 cents as dividends, and I divide by the price at the start of the month. Where do I use the price at the start of the month? Because that's what I actually invest, right? I buy the shares at 30.22. Don't use an average price or an end of the period price because it's what you paid at the start. My percentage return during the month was 7.88%. And I do this for every month for 59 months. You have 60 months of data, you'll end up with 59 months of returns because you lose one month the first month. So that was the easy half of the equation. I now have to do the same thing for the S&P 500. I can get the index levels for the S&P 500 every month. That'll give me the price change in the index. But you know what's messy about the S&P 500? There are 500 companies, each of which pays dividends at a different point in time. So I actually have to get the dividends that I've received if I bought the index each month. It's not difficult to do. You can actually, the you know, S&P itself reports dividends by month. So I had to collect the dividends. And here's what it looked like. The index level at the end of November was 1,095. At the end of December was 1,115. So there's a change in the index. And during the month, the dividends were 1.683. It's stayed in what are called dividend units. So basically you can see the dividends by month. My percentage return on the index is 1.78%. So if you just focus on that month, Disney had a much better month in December of 2009 than the market. Who knows what the reason was? Maybe something happened at Disney that caused the price to jump. And I do this every month for 59 months. So I want you to visualize an Excel spreadsheet. I have 59 months of re returns on Disney, 59 months of returns on the S&P 500. I have to run a regression. I know your statistics class is already fading away. And for many of you, it was using what's mini tab. Is that what you use in your statistics class, some package? But I'm gonna take you back in time to see what a regression actually tries to do. You know what a scatter plot is? In a scatter plot, here's what you do. You take returns on the stock. So Disney is, is on the y-axis, returns in the index, and you take each month. So each of these blue points is a month of data. So I take November, December, so each point is plotted out. So in the scatter plot, all you will see are these blue points. You know what you're trying to do in a regression? You're trying to get the best fit line. You think, how the hell am I going to do that? You could try to eyeball it, right? My advice is don't do it. You're going to get dizzy. So what is the statistical rule that drives how you get the best fit line? Anybody remember your statistics enough that you can tell me how you fit that line? Yes. It's a, it's a, it doesn't have to be absolute, right? Because if you square it, it will become, so minus or plus, it'll all become positive. You're minimizing the squared distances. You know how people used to run regressions before computers? They would sit there with a ruler and measure the distances. Now you could see why sample sizes stayed small and regressions were small because this was extraordinarily tedious. But that's what you're doing in an ordinary least squared regression. Thank God for statistics packages because they do it for you. But again, what I'm saying is a statistics package is not doing magic. It's fitting that line based upon minimizing the squared distances. So there's my best fit line. When you have a best fit line, you get output. I know this is reviewing statistics, but there are three pieces of output that, that, that bear looking at. The first is called the intercept. The intercept is where the line crosses the axis. You think, who really cares? There's an economic significance I'm going to attach to the intercept that's going to tell me something about my company. That's all I'm doing in this regression. I don't care about statistics. I care about what I can learn from this regression about my company. So first piece of output is the intercept, 0.0071 or 0.71% if you want to think of percentage terms. The second piece of output 
is the slope. Now this is the sign in at least in finance, this is the number that we run the regression for, right? If you believe this regression, this is the beta for the company, 1.2517. The third piece of output is the R squared. Statistically, the R squared tells me what percentage of the variation in my X variable, the market I'm explaining with the stock. So based on this regression, it looks like about 73% of the variation in my, I'm sorry, in the variation in the stock is explained by the market. Again, we're going to look at the economic significance. Who cares? Why does it matter? Intercept, slope, R squared. But before I leave the regression, I want you to also look at these numbers in brackets below my intercept and my slope coefficient. You know what those are? Those are standard errors. That's truth in advertising. When you run a regression and you say, this is my beta, you also have to tell people, by the way, this is how uncertain about, I'm about the beta. This is what the standard error is. So if I had no access to a Bloomberg or any kind of service, I could do this with Excel or even without Excel. I could do it with a slide rule and a sheet of paper, and I could get the intercept, the slope, the R squared, and the standard errors. So what I'd like to do is take this regression and deconstruct it and find out what it tells me about my company, because after all, that's why we're under regression. Let's start with the intercept. This is the trickiest of the, of the output to, to kind of work with. So I want you to kind of hang in there. If you have questions, kind of raise them so we can deal with them. The intercept is 0.712%. So I've taken the 0 0.0071 and stated as a percent. So that's what I, so one way to think about the intercept is in a market where the, in a month where the market did nothing, I made 0.712%. The question I have to ask is, in a month in which the market made nothing, if the cap M were true, what would the intercept look like? So the actual intercept is 0.712%. I'm going to try to figure out what the intercept should have been if the cap M are true. So what I do is I take the risk-free rate, and we went through the algebra for why this, is, why this works. I take the risk-free rate, which is 0.5% a month, because I'm looking at monthly risk-free rates. I convert it to a monthly risk-free rate by just dividing by 12. If you want to do fancy stuff and do a compounding effect, you're welcome to. It won't make much of a difference. So 0.042%. I multiply the 0.042% by one minus the beta. This sounds like convoluted logic, but what I'm trying to estimate is what the intercept should have been if the cap M held. And the intercept should have been minus, minus 0.01%. So here's what I have. The actual intercept is 0.71%. And if the cap M had been right, it should be minus 0.01%. The difference between those two numbers is what I'm going to call Jensen's alpha. Jensen's alpha measures how well or badly my stock did during the period of the regression after adjusting for risk and after adjusting for market performance. Lots of qualifiers there, so let me repeat that. Jensen's alpha measures how well or badly my stock did. Keyword is did, not will do. So it's, it's post-mortem. During the period of my regression, it's not a statement about forever. After adjusting for risk, the beta adjusts for risk and the market, because that's what the regression does. It, it cleans up for the market. So what does this regression tell me during this particular period, October 20, you know, 2008 to September 2020, uh, 2013, the Jensen's Alpha on a monthly basis for Disney was 0.72%. You're saying that doesn't sound like much. You make 0.72% a month. On an annualized basis, that works out to about 9.02%. Between 2008 and 2013, Disney delivered whatever you would have expected to deliver plus 9.03%. It's, it's icing on the cake. So if you get a Jensen's Alpha of 0%, don't bitch and moan. You made your expected return. A Jensen's Alpha that is positive essentially may, means you made more than you expected. Here's a simplistic way of thinking about it. Let's suppose you have a stock with a beta of 2 the market's up 20%. Remember, your stock is twice as risky as the market. Let's for the moment ignore the risk free rate. Let's say it's close to zero like it was for much of the last decade. If this market is up 20% and you have a stock with a beta of two, what would you expect that stock to do 
when the market is up 20%. It's twice as risky as the market. Market's up 20%. What should your stock be up by? But 40%, right? You're saying that's so greedy. If you have a stock with a bait of two, you need to build up fat on the way up because you're going to burn that fat off on the way down because that bait of two is going to turn against you in a month when the market is down 20%. You're not being greedy. You're being prudent. When I say the Jensen's Alpha is 9%, here's what I'm saying about the stock. It made 40% plus 9%. It made 49%. It's over and above your expected return. That's why it's risk adjusted and market adjusted. So Jensen's Alpha is a postmortem. It's a measure of actual performance, going back in time, adjusted for risk, adjusted for the market. So I'm going to you know, focus in on that Jensen's Alpha. Let's assume that you computed the Jensen's Alpha for every stock in a market. You start with A, work all the way through Z. For each one you do what I did for Disney. You compute the Jensen's Alpha for every one of them. What should the average Jensen's Alpha be across all stocks? It should be what? Zero. And do you see why? Stocks collectively can't beat themselves. You think, but what if it's a really good year for the market? Remember, I've already adjusted for the market. What if it's a really bad year? It doesn't matter. Whether you have a good year or a bad year for the market, the, it's really the weighted average Jensen's Alpha that's zero because larger companies wait for more. But the Jensen's Alpha should be zero. For every winner, there's a loser. So you take the last five years, you look at the Jensen's Alpha for Tesla, you know what you're going to find, right? Amazingly high Jensen's Alpha. But while you're celebrating for holding Tesla, you should get down and you say, thank you, God, for not letting me hold Bed Bath & Beyond. Because you know what the Jensen's Alpha for Bed Bath & Beyond looks like, right? It's a huge, for every Tesla, there's got to be a Bed Bath & Beyond. So I know people look as I wish I'd bought Tesla. And people spend their life regretting not buying something that's gone up a lot. And my advice to them is be thankful you did not buy the Bed Baths and Beyond. So in a sense, if you spend your life regretting not doing things in hindsight, you might as well regret about, you know, look at both sides of the equation. And Jensen's Alpha is a backward looking measure of how well or badly your stock performed. So mechanics of Jensen's Alpha and looking across stocks, I want to make sure everybody is comfortable with them. Let's move on. Disney had a positive Jensen's Alpha of 9%, right? During this period. It did much better than expected. Can I take that as a sign that management at Disney must have done a really good job? Because um, why not? You, you say, you're, why not? But this is Disney relative to the market, right? So it took whatever the market did and delivered 9%. So it must be something that's happening at Disney, that's not happening at the market. The, the generic, yes. Okay, I, and in fact, that's, if you, if you look at oil companies last year, they're all, all had huge positive Jensen's alphas. So if you take Exxon Mobil, big positive Jensen's alpha, before you give the managers a bonus, what's the question you need to ask? Is this something they create? And the answer is absolutely not. Why were the Jensen's Alphas high at oil companies? Because oil prices went up. The only company where might reward management is Aramco because they can actually affect oil prices. Every other oil company is a price taker in the game. So before I give management a reward, I have to look at, is this something that's sector wide or is this something that's company specific? Is there a way I can do that? Or what would I need to do? To, to, In other words, compute the Jensen's Alpha for every company in the industry, right? If the average Jensen's Alpha for entertainment companies is 11% and Disney made only 9%, I should probably fire. Uh, that might be overreaction, but I should not be rewarding management for things they did not create. Now, it's one of the things I have trouble with when, uh, when I see compensation packages tied to stock prices. Is this your doing? If you're an oil company CEO and your stock price goes 50%, why am I giving you options and a bonus when you had nothing to do with it? So when you look at the Jensen's Alpha for your company and you see a big positive number, before you celebrate about the greatness of your management, you might want to look at the Jensen's Alpha across all stocks. If you go to my 
webpage, I actually have average Jensen's Alphas by industry group. And I keep it for myself because I need to compare companies to it. Make that comparison. Conversely, if you get a big negative Jensen's Alpha before you jump down the throats of management, you might want to look at the average for the sector as well because it might be a sector-wide phenomenon. Yes. Well, the market share shows up in your pricing. So if that's the, you know, to the extent that your market share was already priced in, in 2008, high market share alone can't give you a high Jensen's Alpha. Otherwise, we just buy companies high market shares. What has to happen to market share for you to actually get a positive Jensen's Alpha? Your market share has to increase unexpectedly, right? If it's, it has to be something unexpected, right? Because if it's expected, it's in the price of the start, it's the price of the beginning. At the, at the end, it has to be something that's unexpected. And the question you've got to ask is, is that unexpected thing that's happening due to the management or due to something that's sector-wide? Because if it's due to the management, then I think you're entitled to say, hey, you know what? That management reward, deserves a reward. Let's take a third, a third part. Disney had a positive Jensen's Alpha looking backward. It's a fact. Now we can ask about, no, should it be eight and a half or nine and a half percent? Clearly they did much better than expected. Does that mean as an investor looking at Disney that this would be a good investment for the future? In fact, I indirectly answered that question. Why shouldn't I just go buy stocks with positive Jensen's alphas and expect to get rewarded? And because that mean I should buy Tesla, I should buy the companies that have done the best over the last five years. What's the problem with using Jensen's alphas as your forward-looking number? Why is the Jensen's Alpha high? Because your price has already gone up, right? So in a sense, you're buying the stocks that have gone up the most in price. In fact, you could argue that maybe you should buy the worst Jensen's Alpha's companies because you're a contrarian. That's exactly where you're going, right? You're saying those are the companies where I'm going to get bargains because they're priced down. In investing, there is this phenomenon called momentum chasing. A lot of portfolio managers chase momentum. Sounds like a fancy thing. But 80% of investing, in my view, is momentum chasing. What do you do? You look at the companies that did the best in the last year, and you run after them. It's been a terrible investment strategy in hindsight, because you're often buying companies at their absolute peaks and then feeling the effects as they decline. So any questions on Jensen's Alpha? Measure of performance, but it's a postmortem. It's a measure of past performance, not a measure of what you can do in the future. Let's move on to the slope, that magical number that we ran the regression to get, right? The slope, at least if you believe your corporate finance textbooks, is the beta. Somewhere in finance, I think we forget all about statistics. Because it's true, you get a slope. The slope is the beta. But it's also true that slope came with a standard error, right? So I want you to play the role of a beta estimation service. I'm analyzing Disney. It's 2014. I call you and say, hey, I want a beta for Disney. Give me a point estimate, single number. What's your point estimate for the beta based on the regression? It's 1.25. And then you hang up the phone really quickly. You know why? Because you're afraid of my follow-up question. I said, that's your point estimate with about 67% confidence Give me a range on your beta. This is magic about a 67% confidence. It's plus or minus one standard error. So with six, which is not a whole lot of confidence, right? You're going to be wrong a third of the time. With 67% confidence, you're going to take the 1.25 plus or minus the 0 0.10, which means your beta can be 1.15 to 1.35. Now, do you see why I wanted to hang up the phone really quickly? Because you want to create the illusion of precision. Add a third decimal point to make it look like you know more than you do. If I ask for 95% confidence, now we're looking at two standard errors. 1.05 to 1.45. Forget about 99%. You think this is maybe just Disney? It's not. In fact, if you compute the standard errors, for the for betas for US companies, the median standard error for the beta for US companies is between 0.2 and 0.25. The next time you see a service 
estimated beta. Yahoo does it, you know, Bloomberg does it, Barra does it. They're giving you a regression beta. They might tweak it a little bit, but remember it comes with this hefty range around it, which means that you don't have a, a, a fact, you have a range. You don't have, a, so a beta coming from a regression is going to be noisy. I'm going to use that word to anytime you have an estimate which has a big standard error. I'm digging a hole for regression betas, if you're not noticing, so I can bury it. So my first piece of ammunition against regression beta is it's noisy. Is it backward looking or forward looking? It's backward looking. My regression came from looking at the last five. I can't look at the next five years. So it's backward looking and it's noisy. Any questions on the standard error of the beta? Let's talk about the R squared. Statistics, we know what the R squared tells us, right? Statistics class, you want to make the R squared higher and higher. Don't do that when you're running beta regressions. In fact, I'm going to show you how you get a really high R squared and the beta you get will be absolutely useless. But the way to think about the R squared is to go back to the start of the CAPM again. Remember in the, in the third step of the CAPM, we talked about what kind of risk you get rewarded for and what kind of risk you don't get rewarded for. Somebody remind me again. What do we assume in the cap and that investors are diversified and therefore what type of risk gets rewarded? Risk that you cannot diversify away, right? Because that's going to be left even after you diversify. What kind of risk is it? It's related to the market. It's macroeconomic risk. Now, do you see why the R squared has significance? If you trust the R squared, what is it telling you? 73% of the risk in Disney comes from the market from macroeconomic forces. The 27%, which is 100% minus the 72%, is company specific risk. So as you diversify away, that 27% is going to go away. So when you think about the R squared, don't think of it as a statistical number. Think of it in terms of what does it tell me about my company? If you have young tech companies, don't be surprised to see R squares of 8%, 9%, 10%. You know what that tells you, right? It tells you two things. One is 90% of the risk in this company comes from the company. That's no surprise. You know, the second thing it tells you, for God's sakes, don't take all your money and put it in that one stock. Because you're asking for trouble. Because 90% of the risk you're going to ex get exposed to, you will not get rewarded for. Now, there's one fact about R squares because I've been computing these R squares for US companies going back to the 1990s. The R squares have drifted up, actually gone up substantially since 2008. Pre-2008, the average R squared for US company was maybe 20, 25%. Now it's closer to 45 to 50%. So this is not just one company, across all companies. How do you explain, and this is not just US companies, globally you're seeing R squares go up. What does it tell you about companies, the market, and investing when you see higher R squares? Anybody want to give a shot at that? What do we say R squared measures? How much of the risk in a company comes from macroeconomic or market forces, right? If that number's risen across all companies, what is it telling you about risk at companies? That more and more of the risk in companies is coming from things they don't control. Macroeconomic forces. And that's potentially dangerous for investors who ignore macroeconomic risks. If you go back 40 or 50 years, you look at value investing books. Their advice is just focus on your company. Don't worry about the market. Don't worry about macroeconomic forces. Things will average up. But today, if you took that advice, you might be in some danger because more and more of the risk, even at mature companies, is coming from the market. And if you don't factor in what inflation will do in 2023 or what the economy will do in 2023, you're more at risk now than you were 40 years ago. It's made investing more difficult because investing is about picking individual companies, not worrying about macroeconomic forces. And since 2008, you're more at the mercy. And 2020 with COVID brought this home in complete, you know, in a complete, as a complete factor because everybody was affected. You could have picked the best company in the face of the earth after all the research you did and it'd still be devastated like everybody else. 
So there's a lesson here that's worth learning when you think about, you know, investing. So let me complete. Any, any other questions about the mechanics of R squared and what it tells you about companies? So let me kind of finish up the R squared discussion. Let's assume you're looking at two companies. You're an investor. In fact, let me make you a diversified investor. You're on a mutual fund. You're looking at two companies. The first is Disney. The second is, let's say, Amgen, biotech company. Both have the same betas. But Amgen has an R squared of 73%. But I'm sorry, Disney has an R squared of 73%, but Amgen's R squared is only 25%. So they have the same beta, but one company has a much lower R squared than the other. Remember, you're a diversified investor. You're thinking about, should I invest in Disney or Amgen? As a diversified investor, would you pick the company with the higher R squared or the lower R squared, or do you not care? So you said lower R squared. So if you pick the lower R squared, what's your rationale for doing it? Now, let's take that because we're all risk averse, right? It's not if, we're all risk averse. Otherwise, we would not be adjusting for risk in the first place. And what happens at 75%? As a, diverse, as a diversified investor, what happens is 75%? Okay. So it's gone, right? So you pick the 73%, the 27 So either way, the firm-specific risk gets diversified. So as a diversified investor, you can pick either stock. The diversifiable risk gets averaged out. What are you left with at the end? Your beta risk, and that's the same in both companies. So I'm missing why the lower R squared would help you because you've eliminated the rest of the risk anyway, right? As a diversified investor, do you see why you don't care about firm-specific risk? It's all going to go away anyway. But if you're not diversified, now we have a real choice to make. If you're not diversified, you only leave three stocks or four stocks. Do you want a high R-squared company or a low R-squared company? No, you know exactly. The only risk you're going to get paid is the market risk. But if you're not diversified, no, but remember, if you're not diversified, you're still exposed to all that other risk, right? Don't you want to minimize all that other risk you're not going to get rewarded for? If you're not diversified, you're right. At the end of the process, the market doesn't look at how diversified you are. It pays you for the risk you could not diversify away. So the expected returns on these two companies is going to be pretty much the same, right? They have the same betas. But if you're not diversified, guess what? You're exposed to all the firm-specific risk. And if that's the case, you don't want to buy Amgen because now you're exposed to all that risk for which you're not. For God's sake, if you're going to hold a concentrated portfolio, don't hold four tech companies or small tech companies. Buy JP Morgan Chase, buy Disney, buy four companies that are in multiple businesses that are diversified on their own because you're letting the company do the work for you. Because if you don't do that, you're going to be incredibly, incredibly exposed. exposed. Now, do you see why concentration as an advice to investors can be dangerous? Because you don't concentrate your portfolio. Buy the five best companies. And add a, add a qualifier. Make sure those five best companies are not these idiosyncratic companies where much of the risk comes from the company. You buy five biotech companies, God help you, right? You got three FA, you know, you know, three drugs that don't make it through the approval process. You could lose all your money. So R squares don't mean much if you're a diversified investor. If you have 30, 40, 50 companies in your portfolio, don't even look at R squared. It doesn't matter. But three or four or five companies, it might make sense to say, are these the kinds of companies I want to put all my money in? So until 2000, every person who took this class had to do this regression on their own, right? So I'd go through the class and I said, see what I did for Disney, go collect 60 months of data on Disney, 60 months on the index or whatever company you're doing, run the regression. And it's not rocket science, it, but it's tedious. You got to enter the numbers in a spreadsheet, make sure you don't get the months off. In, oh. I think, about 20 years ago, we got our first Bloomberg terminal. It was a godsend for me because now I could say, we know how to run the regression. But rather than go through the tedium, why don't you go to a Bloomberg terminal, type in the name of your company, type in beta, and you're going to get the beta page. So I took my own advice after I ran the regression in Disney. 
in 2013. I went to a Bloomberg terminal, I typed in Disney, typed in beta, and I played with the, uh, because the standard regression in, in Bloomberg, when you open it up, is a two-year weekly regression. I changed to five-year monthly to make it match up. I wanted to see if Bloomberg came back with the same numbers that I did, because if it didn't, we have a problem, right? We're looking at the same company, same market index, same period. And I'll give you the good news first. The beta that they came back with was 1.247. You remember what I got? 1.25, something round up. You know, that's pretty close to the same beta. So I said, that's good. We're, we're on the same page. The, we'll come back and talk about the adjusted beta. The intercept they came back with is 0.60%. You remember what my intercept was? 0.71%. And I saw this show up systematically on beta after beta. The intercept didn't quite match. So I did a little digging because looking at the same period, same stock, same index, why am I getting a different intercept? When I ran my regression for Disney against the S&P 500, remember how I computed returns every three months, I went and added the dividend and for, to Disney to get the return. And for the index every month I went and added, it's a pain in the neck. Most services, when they run these regressions, because the computer runs it and they don't want to give it this extra work of go get the dividend, especially on the index, run regressions with just the price change portion. You're saying that's sloppy? It is. But their response is most people come here for the beta. They don't even look at the intercept. The beta is roughly the same. So why are you making such a big deal about it? And for most companies, you can get away with it. So the intercept is slightly different. My point, I think my 0.712 is more precise, but I'm not going to again make a fuss about it because it's not changing my perspective, perspective on Disney. It still did better than expected by about 7% rather than 9%. The R squared, 73%. So if you look at those three pieces of output, the R squared, the intercept, and the slope, and you also look at the standard error, I'm pretty close on all of the numbers. The intercept is the number I'm probably furthest on. I'm going to let you run a Bloomberg regression beta for your company rather than do it on your own. If you insist on doing it on your own, I mean, I, you can go get the data. It's not difficult to do. So you can check Bloomberg if you want, but for the most part, you're going to find what I did. But on a few companies, you might actually get betas that are, that are significantly different on Bloomberg than you do if you do it right with the dividends. What kinds of companies do you think it, make, it will make a big difference not including dividends? Companies that pay big dividends. You take a REIT, you run a beta for a REIT, you're going to get a misleading beta. You take a company that has a 4% dividend yield, that's a bulk of your return, you ignore it. So we know the companies, we're going to run into a little bit of an issue. So if you have one of those companies, I would encourage you to run the regression on your own and see if you get a different beta. So every piece of output that I got from my Excel spreadsheet is on the Bloomberg beta page. Saying, what about the adjusted beta? When I say adjusted beta, be honest. What are you getting visions of? Somebody at Bloomberg sitting there adjusting the beta, right? Or maybe a group of people adjusting the beta. Let go of the delusion. The adjusted beta is the raw beta adjusted towards one. In fact, until about... 10 or 15 years ago, Bloomberg actually used to show as the equation right below the regression, they say adjusted beta is two thirds times the raw beta plus one third times one. You're saying, what? If your raw beta is 1.8, two thirds of 1.8 is 1.2 plus one third of one is 0 0.33. 1 1.8 becomes 1.53. As I go through these examples, see if you see a pattern. So 1.8 becomes 1.53. 1.5 will become 1.33, 1.2 will become 1.13, 0. 0.6 will become 0. 0.73. They're moving the betas towards one. Why do you think they do that? It's the average beta across all companies. Right? They're trying to be helpful. They're saying, you know what? Your company will probably get bigger over time. It'll probably look more like the market over time. So we're going to move the beta towards one for you, to which you respond, please stop helping. Because these weights, two-thirds and one-third, 
are the weights that Bloomberg uses on every single adjusted beta calculation across the 40,000 companies they estimate betas for. It must be magical that the same weights work for Japanese companies, companies in Zimbabwe, companies, same adjustment. So when I first ran into this calculation, remember it used to be right there in, as an equation below. We'll talk about why Bloomberg might have taken it out because maybe by taking it out, you can keep the illusion alive that there's actually a person working on adjusting these betas. I was curious about where did they come up with the two third and one third? I kind of knew the answer, but I wanted to see if they knew the answer. So I called Bloomberg, not the mayor, but the company. Maybe I should have called the mayor, I might've gotten an answer better. And they put me in touch with the beta calculation guy at Bloomberg. There's actually a guy at Bloomberg whose life it is to maintain this page. Imagine how exciting his life must be. Goes to a cocktail party, says, I'm the beta guy from Bloomberg. Dozens of people gather around for anecdotes. Not. The guy was pathetically grateful to get a call from the outside world. I don't know what they do to the guy. Maybe keep him locked up in a basement room, feed him through a hole in the wall, whatever it is. So I'm so glad you called. I have all day to answer your questions. I don't have all day to ask him the questions, but I was afraid that if I hung up the phone too soon, he'd do something rash. So after a few minutes of what I thought was polite conversation, I hit him with a question. Why two thirds and one third? He said, huh? And two minutes of silence. I can hear terminals being turned off and on, papers being rustled. Then he comes back on and he says, I don't know, it was here when I got here. I said, what? He said, I was hired two years ago, it was already here, don't blame me. I'm saying, I'm not trying to blame you. I just want to see where these two thirds and one third weights come from. I, said, I don't know, here when I got here. If you ever go to work in any area of business, you'll notice numbers being used. He said, where did that number come from? Why would you use a 6% equity risk? I don't know. Here when I got here seems to be the response that you often get to numbers companies use. Why is your hurdle rate 15%? I don't know. It was here when I got here. When did you get here? 1979? Never stopped and asked why. Well, I don't pick up rocks to see what's under them. What I'm trying to say in a long-winded way is there's no information in the adjusted beta. All it's telling you is which direction one is. And if you have trouble on that question, maybe you shouldn't be looking at a beta page in the first place. If I give you a beta 1.5 and ask you to get to one, you know what you need to do, right? Go 1.4, 1.3. If I want to lower the beta to one, I can do it myself. I don't need somebody holding my hand saying, let me give you a number closer to one just in case you're confused. Every service plays this game. They take the regression beta, they finesse it. And they call it a predicted beta, an adjusted beta, a forecasted beta, as if something magical is going on. Nothing is going on. It's still the same crappy regression beta dressed up and pushed out there. You're still going to have all of the issues with standard error with that adjusted beta. So print the page, the beta page for your company. If you don't believe me about the two thirds and the one, try it out for your company. Take two thirds times the raw beta plus one third times one. See if you get the adjusted beta. But now I want to complete the process. Now let's for the moment at least take the regression beta. I don't, I have qualms about using it, but let's say that I trust my own regression that the regression beta for Disney is 1.25. Don't forget that this entire process that started six sessions ago was about getting a hurdle rate. I think we lost sight of it along the way. We got a risk-free rate and equity. We're now there. We have a risk-free rate, the currency that we want, an equity risk premium reflecting where you do business. Let's see you take the beta from the regression. In the case of Disney, the risk-free rate in November 2013 was 2.75%. The equity risk premium based on where they do business is 5.76%. The beta is 1.25. I plug the numbers in. I come up with an expected return for Disney of 9.95%. If you've taken a finance class, you do this ad nauseum, right? Risk free rate, later times RM minus RF, you plug and chug. And often you don't stop and ask, what does that really mean? What is this 9.95%? So what I'd like to do is to put some intuitive rationale behind this number. What does it mean to me as an investor? What does it mean to me as a company? So let's take that 9.95% and see whether we can put some real economic meaning to it. Here's what I'm going to do. 
let's say it's November of 2013. You're a potential investor in Disney. You're thinking about buying Disney shares. I'm going to make a couple of statements using the 9.95% as my anchor. And you tell me whether this is a reasonable way of thinking about the 9.95%. So here's the first one. 9.95% of the return you can expect to make on Disney in the long term if the stock is correctly priced and the CAPM is the right model for us. How many qualifiers did I put in that sentence? I mean, first, long term. I said, don't come to me next year and say you didn't make 9.95%. I said, long term. Second, the stock has to be correctly priced. If it's mispriced, all bets are off. And the CAPM has to be the right model for risk. That's actually a technically correct definition of the 9.95%. If you believed in efficient markets, that's how you'd read the 9.95%. But to me, it's a very antiseptic definition of the 9.95% because you're completely at the mercy of the beta to get exp So if you want a higher expected return in that market, what do you need to do? You need to buy a stock with a higher beta. So if you believe markets are efficient, the 9.95% is the return you can expect to make in the long term on Disney after you assume that the market stock is correctly priced and the CAPM is the right model for risk. I'm going to read a second statement that I think is a much more active way of thinking about the 9.95%. 9.95% is the return that I need to make. Suddenly I've become very needy. Right, 2.75% is the risk-free rate, but I need to make 9.95%. I need to make in Disney. In the long term, to break even on my investment. I know break even is this kind of nebulous concept. So let's break that apart. I'm investing in Disney. Why shouldn't I just settle for 2.75%? It's a team Andre. If I'm going to make 2.75%, why am I exposing myself to all this additional risk and losing sleep at night? I just buy the t bond, right? The essence of risk taking is I need some reward. It's not because I'm greedy, but because you're inducing. So the reason I don't settle for the 2.75% is that's on a risk-free investment. I'm asking for 9.95% because this stock is not just risky. It's 1.25 times more risky than the average stock in the market. That's a much better way to think about the 9.95%. It's what I need to make as an equity investor in Disney to break even. If I don't make the 9.95%, I'm going to get the negative Jensen's help and I'm going to have regrets later on, but that's a return I need to make. So both those statements are right, but the first one I think is too antiseptic for me. It basically assumes stocks are correctly priced. The second one allows me to value companies. And here's why. Let's say you do your own research on Disney. Now that Bob Iger is back, you know, so let's say you're doing this now. You're saying, you know what? Things will be different going forward. Disney Plus is going to be, you know, the streaming is going to be restrained. We're going to do much better. And based on your research, you conclude you can make a 12.5% return on Disney. So this is based on your research. What do you need to make? You need to make 9.95%. You expect to make 12.5%. So if you're thinking... As an equity research analyst, as an investor, does this make the stock a buy or a sell? That becomes a buy. So when you're valuing companies, that's what you're looking for. An internal rate of return that exceeds the 9.95%. When you do a discounted cash flow valuation using the 9.95% as your discount rate, you're saying, can I make more than that? Because the essence of active investing is you want to try to make more than the expected return. So the 9.95% is meaning to us as investors because it becomes our hurdle rate. And you can see it's going to be different for different companies. If I came to you with a stock with a beta of two, you're going to have a much higher hurdle rate to invest in that stock. A beta of 0.5, you're going to settle for a much lower one. It becomes your hurdle rate as an investor in a company stock. Any questions on that? But it does assume that you are a diversified investor, right? If you're not diversified and use that as your hurdle rate, you might actually be making some bad decisions because you're still exposed to all that other risk, which you chose to be exposed to. But let's turn to the other side of the table. So let's say you're all Disney shareholders. You all use my regression. You've used my beta 1.25. You all come up with a 9.95% expected return that you need to make. You're buying my equity, right? If I'm the CFO at Disney, 
and I'm raising equity from you. And remember, raising equity doesn't mean just issuing shares. It could also come you using retained earnings. Retained earnings, after all, is your equity. You see what the 9.95% be becomes to me? If that's the return you need to make to break even, and you're my equity investors, this is my cost of equity. The cost of equity is not some magical concept. It's based on what you need to make. And I need to try to deliver. I can't guarantee that I can deliver it. Try to deliver more than that. So how do I do that? How do I bring that 9.95% as a CFO into my decision process? I expand California Adventure, right? I spend a billion dollars. And I compute the returns that I make for my equity investors from the income I'm going to make in it. I want to make sure the return in equity that I make on my investments exceeds your cost of equity, at least on an expected basis. Bad things can happen, bad surprises, but at least on an expected basis, I need to make more than that 9.95% as my return in equity if I'm creating value for you. You think most companies deliver returns in equity that exceed their cost of equity? Take a look at my fifth data update from this year. I actually look at the return in equity and cost of equity for every publicly traded company in the world, 47,000 no, 47, plus companies. 70% of companies earned returns in equity less than the cost of equity. Some have good excuses. I had a bad year. We're a young growing company. Our future earnings will be higher. But a lot of them are old companies, mature companies that consistently earn less than the cost of equity. Sounds self-defeating, right? You're saying, why would you do that? If you're earning less than your cost of equity, remember you're still making money. If your threshold becomes, I am making money, why are you giving me a hard time? Then making money is just a win already. But making money is not enough. If I have capital tied up in your business and I need to make eight or nine or 10%, you're making only 3%, you're under delivering. But there is an implicit assumption in my cost, in my using the 9.95% as a cost of equity that we need to talk about. I actually um, I remember a conversation I had with the CFO of, uh, of, a, of an Asian family group company. And he says, what's my cost of equity? I said, I don't know, what do you use? He said, I think it's only 2%. I said, that seems odd. I mean, this was in a country where the risk-free rate was 5 or 6%. You know what he was calling his cost of equity, right? What's your only explicit cost you have on equity? The dividends you have to pay. So he was looking at the dividend yield saying it's only 2%. But actually, there's a logic to what he was doing. When you borrow money at 7% and you don't pay the 7%, what happens to you? It's a contractual obligation. You go bankrupt, right? You promise investors 9.95% as Disney's managers, you deliver only 3%. You don't go bankrupt. So what's the consequence of a company consistently delivering less than its cost of equity? You get pissed off and more and more pissed off. And perhaps if you have activist investors in that group, maybe they will get pissed off on your behalf. Maybe a Nelson Peltz will show up, say, what are you guys doing? Spending you know, $30 billion on content and signing up new subscribers. You're draining cash from the company. So I try to explain to him, if you don't deliver your cost of equity, you won't go bankrupt, but your shareholders will get really pissed off at you. He started laughing. He said, do you see the name of the company? I said, yes. So you see the name on my nameplate? I said, yes. Do you see the names match? I said, yes. It's a family control company. He said, there's nothing shareholders can do to me. And already you can see why we spend so much time on corporate governance in a world where shareholders are viewed as the owners of the company. Of course, the cost of equity should be 9.95%. But if you view shareholders as capital providers, not as owners, which a lot of companies do, right? They raise capital from you, but they don't care about you. You can deliver less than the cost of equity without real consequences, which also means you will be taking a lot of projects you shouldn't be taking because you view equity as this cheap source of capital. I've heard companies say retained earnings is free. You see what the, the logic is, right? If I go to a bank and I borrow money, I've got to pay 8%. But this is our money. No, this is not your money. This is your shareholders' money that they've left in the company. So the notion that retained earnings is free runs deep 
in many businesses. It's not free. The cost to retain earnings is the cost of equity. And you need to at least try to deliver more than that cost of equity. You might not guarantee it or you shouldn't guarantee it, but you need to try. So I want you to take your Bloomberg beta pitch and do what I did with this. The output is all there. Start with the intercept, right? Take a look at the intercept. See if your stock did better or worse in the market. You can leave it as a two-year weekly. You don't have to change it if you don't you know. I don't particularly care that you're in a five-year regression unless you want to try it out. So take the two-year weekly regression, run, you know, get your Jensen's alpha for your company. See if your company did better or worse than expected over the two years. Next up, look at the slope, the beta, but then also look at the standard error. Get your ranges on your beta, just like I did for Disney. Third stop, look at the R squared. Get a measure of, hey, in my company, where does the risk come from? If you haven't picked a company yet, view this as an additional nag. God's sake, you can't run a Bloomberg beta page if you haven't picked a company. I, I think it's impossible to do. So if nothing else, adopt a company, you know, view it as one of the a foster company. You know, you're going to have it for four weeks and then you're going to change your mind. Have something you work with because then when you actually pick a company, you've at least worked through that process. And to complete it, I want you to also compute, compute an expected return for your stock. You're saying, but I need a risk free a equity risk. If you picked a company, you've already picked a currency. You know where it operates. The pieces are in place if you choose to use it. And I think it's best to strike when the iron is hot, when things are fresh. If you can do this now, it'll save you a huge amount of time because four weeks from now, six weeks from now, who knows how much you remember from this session. You'll have to go back and watch the whole damn thing. So take the regression apart. As I said, it's the first place where you get acquainted with your company. So with that lead in, I want to talk a little bit about the next phase of the process because I don't like regression betas. They're backward looking, they're noisy. And if you have a private company, as some of you do, there's no chance of getting a regression beta. So at least I want to start to lay the foundations for what it is that really drives your beta. It has to be something fundamental that you do. So to set this process rolling, here's what I'm going to do. Let's assume that I am the CFO of a technology company a very risky software company, and you're my consultant slash banker, and I ask you to estimate my cost of equity. So you open up your corporate finance textbook, you don't quite remember, but you work through, and you, and you come up with a beta of three for me. I'm a very risky company and a cost of equity of 20%. Now, as a CFO, when I see that hurdle rate of 20%, am I happy? No, I want a much lower hurdle rate. This makes it so difficult to find projects, right, with the 20% cost of equity. So I ask you a question. I want you to think about this answer. Is there something I can do as a company to bring down that cost of equity? So clear the question, my cost of equity, as you've stated, is 20%. You've told me that my beta is three. Is there something I can do as a company to bring down my cost of equity? One is, Again, if I had a lot of cash, my beta should come. But how do I overnight get a lot of cash? What can I do as a company? Okay, you're already throwing in two different things. Right? One is if I have debt, you want to bring it down because debt makes my beta higher my cost. So if I have debt, so let me cut off, cut that off at the chase. I don't have any debt. So that that option goes goes away. I could, if I had a lot of cash, it'll bring my beta down because cash, but I don't have cash. I can't go get cash. Or I, I could, right? If I sold half my business and held it in t bills overnight, my beta is going to go to 1.5. In fact, if I made my end game minimizing my beta, you know what I should do? Sell off the entire software business, hold t bills Not a great business to be in. But you can see why managers should not get focused on minimizing beta. But you're right, moving into safer businesses. Rather than cash, let me give you an alternative. The biggest risk for a software company comes from the fact that the old software companies, you made your money on updates or upgrades, which when times are good, you got a lot. Is there a different model that software companies have adopted now to make their revenues more stable and predictable? Look at Adobe, look at Microsoft. So one thing you might suggest is, why don't you change your business model? You might have to give up some revenues as a consequence, as a trade-off, but you get more predictable revenues. So 
if I had debt, I'm going to pay it down. If I can convert some of my business to cash, that will lower my beta. But moving my business into a safer version. And I'll give you one final component that drives your beta. Your beta is driven by the swings in your equity earnings, right? So if you have a lot of fixed costs as a company, your earnings are going to swing more. If I can reduce my fixed costs as a company, maybe by outsourcing some of those costs, that too can lower my bid. I'm, saying, I'm not saying any of these things will increase your value because you have to look through the consequences. But what I'd like you to, th and I'm glad none of you said, why don't you go back to a Bloomberg terminal, try weekly instead of monthly, go back five years, because that's the kind of cosmetic beta shift that might make it look like your beta is lower, but it's really not lowering your true beta as a company. You have to do something substantial to lower your beta. Change your business, reduce debt, or reduce your fixed costs. And we're going to come back and focus on those more critically. But before I complete this process, I want to show you the beta pages for my remaining company so we can at least get that off the table. So just as I did Disney, I looked at Tata Motors in 2013. I ran the regression and I let Bloomberg pick for me. What I mean by that is Bloomberg is incredibly parochial about the way it picks a market index. When asked for a US company, it picks the S&P 500. When it, you ask for an Indian company, it picks the Sensex. Yeah. You could, you could change the index, but in this case, I've left it at the default, but I also then have to adjust my returns for the stock to a total returns as well, right? So it's not just the index that I have to include the dividends in. The returns as they are now are just price changes on the two. Okay? So I've taken the default index, I've left it where it is. Let's see what the output tells us. Yes. What, so help me out. So you raise more equity. You're going to. What are you going to do with the cash? Okay. So lower your beta, right? So if your end game is lowering beta, you can do it lots of different ways. You raise equity. You pay down debt. You get a double whammy, right? You're, so in a sense, that if your objective is my beta is too high, I need to do something about it. You can try to do it, but in some business, it wouldn't make sense. Would you want a young software company to raise fresh equity and leave it in tables? I wouldn't, right? But what is, how does that benefit, right? What's the return on equity you're going to make on that table? 2%, 3%. So there's no benefit you're going to get in terms of the spread, right? So if you're a great software company, the beta of three, but you make a 50% return on equity, I'm okay with you. There's no company gets penalized just for being risky as long as it can deliver returns that beat that cost of equity. That's why I think making your end game, lowering your cost of equity, especially if you're a young software company, you're missing, you've lost the script. You should be focusing on earning higher returns, not trying to lower your cost of equity. Okay. So this regression, let's break it up again. Let's start with the beta. The beta that I got from the regression was 1.83. And if I put in the plus or minus standard errors, the range starts to show up. So just like the Disney beta, you're getting this big range around the beta. The R squared was 69%. To the extent that I trust this regression, 69% of the risk in Tata Motors comes from the market. 31% is company specific. The 31% can be diversified away. The 69% cannot. And if you look at the intercept, the intercept was 2.28%. Bloomberg is very sloppy about decimals and percentages. So don't jump on me for that. The 2.282 there is actually already in percent. But when they do the R squared, it's a so the R is in decimal. So don't ask me why they have decimals and percentages mixed together. That's the way they do it. So the intercept is 2.28%. You subtract out the risk-free rate, which was 4% in Indian rupees monthly, made monthly. You get an Jensen's alpha of 2.56% a month. That's phenomenal because on an annual basis, that works out to 35% a year. What does that tell you? I wish I'd bought Tata Motors in 2008. That's all it tells you because if you'd bought it in 2008, held it through 2013, you'd have made whatever you expected to make plus 35% a year. Now, often when you get a positive Jensen's Alpha, I want you to stop at least for a few minutes and say, what did my company do? Or a big negative Jensen's Alpha, what did my company do that might explain it? Usually it's gotta be something big when you get a Jensen's Alpha this huge. 
What do you think Tata Motors did between 2008? This is an unfair question because you need to be familiar with the company. They must have done something big between 2008 and 13 that paid off. There's a massive upside. What did they? I'm sorry, they did an M&A, but do you know who they bought? They bought Jaguar Land Rover from Ford in 2009. Usually M&A is not a great value creating activity because you pay premium prices. But Tata Motors got lucky. They bought Jaguar Land Rover in 2009 from Ford. You're saying, so what? 2009, if you remember, right after the 2008 crisis, automobile companies, especially in the US and Europe, were desperate for cash. They wanted to get rid of what they viewed as bad businesses. And Ford viewed Jaguar Land Rover then as a business that wasn't pulling its weight. They'd have sold it for any price, and they did. Tata Motors got lucky. They got Jaguar Land Rover at a bargain basement price. Almost all of that Jensen's Alpha can be traced back to that one big investment paying off big time. If they'd overpaid, you know how it's going to show up? A big negative Jensen's Alpha. When you see a big positive or a big negative Jensen's Alpha, Rather than think of it just as a number, try digging a little deeper, see what's causing it. And you will see usually something big happening, causing that the stock price to move. Now, in some cases, it's just death in slow motion, right? You look at Bed Bath & Beyond, you say, why is the Jensen's Alpha so negative? Because nobody is going into their stores. You'd have to pay me to go into a Bed Bath & Beyond now. It's always a depressing place to be. Now it's a super depressing place to be. Everything is marked down. Take everything out. You don't even have to stop and pay for it. It doesn't make sense for us to even hire cashiers. Sometimes business models melt down, right? That's what disruption does. When you have disruption, we talk about the exciting side, the disruptors. Have you ever stopped and thought about the disrupted? When you talk about Uber, think about the taxi cab medallion market in New York. So when you see Jensen's alphas be positive and connected to economics, connected to business, it'll give it that added value. So what do we learn from Tata Motors? Based on the regression, it's a very risky company, if you trust its beta. Gets much of its risk from the market. It's an automobile company, after all. Had a great five years. Doesn't mean it'll be a, have a future five years that are great. Yes. Ford actually just survive. Survival was such a good thing for an automobile company in the US. Remember GM had to go for bankruptcy. That survival actually gave them a decent Jensen's Alpha. Odds are that it would have been even better if they'd kept Jaguar Land Rover in them. But surviving and getting to 2013 was viewed as a win for any automobile company. No. Let's talk about Vale. And here I'm going to introduce what I call beta gaming. Analysts play this all the time. And I wanted to introduce how the gaming was. To do beta gaming, first you need access to Bloomberg Terminal. So you type in the name of your company, you type in, hey, it runs the, the parochial regression. For Vale, that's again above Vespa. So the regression to the left is my beta regression for Vale and use the above Vespa because it's a Brazilian company. Let's say you don't like this beta. You say, why would I not like the beta? What kinds of biases you have in valuation? You want a high beta, low beta. Let's say you don't like this beta. I could try a second regression where I take Vale's ADR, which is listed and traded in the US and US dollars, and run the regression against the S&P 500. I have two different regressions here, right? And if I asked you, which is the better regression, what does your statistical side tell you to look at? What do we train in statistics look at when we think which regression is better? Higher R squared, right? Higher R squared is supposed to be a better regression. Do you see the danger of this? Because when you run a regression of a stock against a local index, you're almost always going to get a higher R squared than if you run it against a global index or an index that's much broader. The, re the beta regression for Siemens against the DAX is always going to look much better than the beta regression for Siemens against all European stocks or a global index because Siemens is a big part of the DAX. It's just mathematical. So what I'm trying to say is when you sit in front of the Bloomberg and you try different indices and you find one that gives you a 95% R squared, you should be terrified because you probably just ran a regression of a stock against itself. 
It's 80% of the index or 70% of the index. Of course, you're going to get a great R squared. But that doesn't become the measure of, is this a good regression? You're trying to measure the risk added on to the portfolio of not your portfolio, my portfolio, but the marginal investor in this company. You know who the marginal investor in Vale is likely to be? Probably BlackRock. Because remember, the, the voting shares, which are not traded, are not the marginal investors. It's the non-voting shares. It's some foreign institutional investor. It's not some individual in Brazil sitting there saying, I'm put, putting all my money in Brazilian companies. I'm going to buy Vale. So in a sense, I'm, this is a fault, not just with you know, Vale or with Siemens. It's a fault with all companies of staying with the parochial index. You notice it less with US companies. Why? Because the S&P 500, even though it's technically US index, those 500 companies that go to the S&P 500 get about 40% of their revenues outside the US. They're really global companies that happen to be in corporate and trade. And that's why you can get away with the S&P 500 index. The S&P 500 and the MSCI are actually very highly correlated for that reason. Let's complete the process. For Deutsche, I actually ran a regression against the DAX and against the FTSE. Euro 100, right? It's a bad investment. Either way, the Jensen's alpha is negative. We knew that already. Deutsche, you don't even have to bother running the regression. It's going to have a negative Jensen's alpha. It seems the company seems you run with that end game. We're going to have a negative Jensen's alpha. We'll do whatever we can to get there. But look at how different the betas are against the indices. You think, which one should I use? My answer is they're both crappy. And this is the problem with playing with the regression is there's really no end game where you're gonna walk away saying that is the right beta. That's a beta that I can trust because every single regression you're gonna run, you're gonna look at it. if the R squared is too high, you're gonna say that's because I picked a bad index. The R squared is too low, you have noise. There's no way out of this box. If you run a regression beta right, you should get a low R squared and a high standard error. So it's, a, it's not a bug, it's a feature of risk being diversifiable. And for Baidu, I ran the regression against the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, very different betas. I've seen people run betas for tech companies against the NASDAQ on this misguided notion that it's a better index for tech companies. It's a tech index. Guess what you're gonna get? A higher R squared, but it's not a beta that you can use to get an expected return for a company. So go with indices that are broader rather than narrower. So I'm gonna, leave you with with a final page where I'm going to at least start what we're going to do in the next session. As I said, regression betas are an awful way to think about betas. They're backward looking, they're noisy, you can play games with them. But I haven't given you an alternative, right? So what do I do instead? So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to break betas down. And we've already started this discussion and talk about what it is about a company that's giving it the beta that it has. So this is from a while back, so many of these companies might not even be in existence, but I'm going to give you a company and a beta, and I want you to give me an economic rationale for why the company has the beta that it does, if you can find one. Start at the top, Bulgari, high beta. What is it about Bulgari that you think gives it a high beta? What does Bulgari sell? Stuff that nobody needs at exceptionally high prices, right? You're saying, I can't live without my Bulgari. You might need to see a psychiatrist. It's incredibly discretionary. Canal Street, you can probably get Bulgari knockoffs for like $20. Incredibly discretionary product. File that away. Companies that produce incredibly discretionary products and or provide incredibly discretionary services. So you're a business providing butler services in New York. Expect to have a high beta, right? When times are good, lots of people want butlers. When times are bad, they can live without their butlers. So that's a foot. Let's move down. Quest Communications. Telecom companies tend to have high betas. What is it about telecom? It's not discretionary, right? We all need the services. So what is it about telecom? They're, usually they take a lot of debt. And we'll talk about why. Often it's because... AT&T borrowed money 100 years ago, to, so every telecom company follows the same template. And the second is, remember we talked about fixed costs? Telecom companies have huge fixed costs. So its pathway to a higher beta is very different than Bulgari's pathway. Microsoft, I've been tracking Microsoft beta probably since 1986, the year of their IPO. Maybe the first time I looked at its beta was 88. 
when I started, Microsoft's beta was 1.7, 1.0. It was a risky software company building off this new phenomenon called the PC that was just exploding out of the box. What's changed at Microsoft? Two things. One is its product suite has widened, right? It's, it's, it serves a much broader, it's not just businesses, business. It's got a cloud business. So the business mix is, is changing. And the second is, over time, it's also accumulated a significant cash balance. We talked about how cash reduces betas. This is almost by, op because you're throwing off so much cash as a company, if you don't pay it out, the cash balance builds up. This is the old GE. The new GE is wa a walking dead company. The old GE, remember, used to be in 26 different businesses. The Jack Welch GE that he built. It's a conglomerate. What should happen to the beta of a company if it becomes a conglomerate? It should move towards one, right? It's like a mutual fund. Unless it borrows money to conglomerate. In other words, you go out and do acquisitions, in which case you might have a debt effect. But if you don't use debt, the beta should move towards one. The only reason GE's beta stayed above one in its glory days was the biggest part of GE in its glory days was GE Capital. You think, so what? GE Capital brought about $150 billion of debt into the equation. They're a financial service company that pushed up, it acted as a ballast. Almost there. Let's finish up. Oil companies usually have low betas in the last couple of years. That's kind of shifted. What's the biggest risk an oil company faces, especially a mature oil company? Oil prices moving up and down. Oil prices go up. It's good for oil companies. What is it for the rest of the market, though? Airlines, terrible, right? Your biggest source of risk actually cuts against the rest of the market that keeps the beta down. Philip Morris. Why was Bulgari have such a high beta? What did I say? Very discretionary, right? What does Philip Morris sell? A very not, if you want to really, if people want to know what, what would give me a really low beta, I have some advice. Make your product or service an addiction, right? You're a cocaine company. You're going to have a really low beta. You might have high costs you got to deal with. And I would leave you with a final company, and we'll talk about this when we start. There are very few companies with negative betas. I want you to think about what a negative beta means. And remember, we plug the beta in to get an expected return. And what it is you're actually buying when you buy a negative beta company as an investor. We'll start our next class with that question, but we're going to use it as a launching pad for the forces that determine betas. I will see you on Wednesday. And remember, quiz one week from today.